Hi everyone. We're just waiting to uh, to folks for folks to enter the room. I think we're probably there now. Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Sullivan, and I'm the president and CEO of the Halifax Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're just experiencing a bit of a delay. Minister Jolie was in back-to-back uh, -back meetings, uh, so we expect her to join us momentarily. But uh, I wanted all of you to know where we were, so we've opened up the um, opened up the call. Uh, so I'd like to thank you. I'm going to just launch into this so that uh, we can get a little ahead of things. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to our uh, Navigating COVID-19 webinar series with our special guest uh, when she joins us in a few moments, Minister uh, Melanie Jolie. Uh, today we will have the, uh, the opportunity to ask our questions uh, directly to the minister about uh, the, uh, the actions of the, uh, the Canadian government today. Uh, and any insight that she has uh, on the current status of COVID-19 in Canada. If you have a question for the minister, please raise your hand and we will answer them as time allows. The raise hand function is at the, uh, is at the lower uh, right hand side of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the picture. Emma, I can see you. I think everybody else can see. Oh, no, now you're gone. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I've received a number of questions in advance, uh, and I will be asking the people who submitted those questions to ask their questions directly. Um, I will ask uh, everyone to keep your questions clear and short uh, in order to get through the largest number of questions uh, and uh, to ensure we can answer as many as we can. Over the last several weeks, the Halifax Chamber has hosted a number of informative webinars with experts to support businesses as they adapt to this new reality. We've also been hosting calls every two days with the Nova Scotia Business Labor Economic Coalition, a group of over 150 representatives from government and industry associations. We host MPs, MLAs, the mayor, and other representatives uh, who can answer our questions and provide information that we can then relay to our members uh, and to stakeholders across the province in a timely way. We have a web page where we gather all the important information regarding COVID-19 supports and resources in one spot. You can find links to federal and provincial government support, like the wage subsidy for employers and the recently announced emergency bridge fund from the province of Nova Scotia. So please check out that web page daily for new updates at halifaxchamber.com slash COVID-19. I'd like to start off uh, with a few of my own questions when, uh, when the minister joins. Um, but uh, before I do that, uh, if, uh, uh, if folks uh, could take a look, you could open the, the chat function down, uh, down the bottom of your screen uh, and uh, you can speak to panelists. You can also speak to all panelists and attendees. So I would encourage you if you're as asking a question, to, uh, to uh, ask that question to all panelists and attendees. Uh, and then perhaps either I or another attendee may be able to, uh, to ask that uh, or answer that question. Okay. Um, if any of you have any questions that you think I could answer, I'm happy to do that uh, as we wait for the, uh, for the minister to join. If you'd like to, uh, to type or, or um, Actually, I don't know. Yeah, I guess raise your hand is, is still a function, I think. Uh, so you can certainly ask any questions that you may have along the way. Well, maybe I'll keep talking a little bit about uh, some of the activity that we have uh, at, the, uh, at the Halifax Chamber um, on, uh, on our webinar series in particular. So we have uh, the minister today. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we have uh, working with your financial institution during COVID-19. Uh, this is the, um, with RBC. So uh, I would encourage any of you who are interested in having a conversation with a banker, uh, would encourage you to join that call. Um, in addition, uh, we have uh, oh, another webinar on Thursday, business planning through a crisis uh, with um, who's that? Uh, Sean Sturt, uh, Chartered Professional Accountant, MNP. And then on Friday, we have Fit Friday uh, with Therapeutic Approach Yoga. Um, I see there's a number of comments and questions, lots of comments and questions coming through. 
Um, Andy Fillmore has just posted the bill that passed in Parliament on Saturday. So that was the, uh, the addition uh, to focus on, uh, on the wage subsidy uh, and a number of other uh, smaller housekeeping issues. So I would uh, encourage you to, uh, to take a look at that. Uh, I know it's been reported recently. Judy Rafuse, uh, have you had any feedback on the uh, cap placed on the bridge funding from the province? So I think there's two components there. The two components from the province, uh, one is the, uh, the bridge funding, which is the $1,000 for individuals. The second one is the $5,000 business impact grant. That $5,000, both of those uh, are at this time a one-time uh, payment. Um, I, I don't want to infer anything or give you false hope, uh, but the Premier did allude on a conference call last week that if this continues, that that um, $5,000 business impact grant could be, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the word he used, but basically recharged was the uh, word, was something like the word he used. So my hope is that if this goes on for months, uh, God forbid, that that would be, uh, that would be available to us. Uh, uh, Ross has asked um, if we can open the mic for questions. We will open the, the mic, Ross. Uh, specifically, we'll call on folks. Oh, I wonder if that is the minister. It is me. And there you are. Welcome, Minister Jolie. Uh, so I've done a bit of an intro um, at this point, but I'll finish off my intro by introducing you. So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's uh, the Honorable Melanie Jolie was first elected to represent Ohunsuk Cartierville. I, I'm sure I've got that wrong. But anyway, close to Montreal in the yeah. House of Commons in 2015. In her ministerial roles, Minister Jolie has worked to support Canada's economic development, to promote Canadian culture, and to grow and increase the visibility of Canada's tourism sector. She's also worked to safeguard Canada's two official languages while promoting the use of French in Canada and around the world, including in the digital sphere. Bienvenue, Minister Jolie. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to make some comments before we get started into questions. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so great to uh, be on board with all of you this morning. Well, sorry, this at noon. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have this chance uh, to talk to all of you, answer your questions. Uh, I'm also uh, supported by great MPs that are also on the line. My PS, uh, who is also working with me on ACOA, Bonnie Arsenault, uh, Andy Fillmore in Halifax, and also uh, Daryl Sanson. Uh, and so uh, thank you guys for being uh, on, uh, on this call and making sure to answer questions to many of the entrepreneurs in, in Nova Scotia. So being the minister in charge of economic development, but particularly in charge of ACOA, I wanted to have the chance to answer your questions and give you a bit the reading of the federal government right now when it comes to uh, you know, the stabilization of our economy and, uh, and, and potentially, well, obviously working on a stimulus package and recovery. So, the three main pillars, the three main priorities of the federal government right now are these ones. The first one is um, really making sure that uh, we uh, are following the health care, the, the health advice from our public health officials uh, and, and making sure people are uh, abiding by the social and physical distancing rules and and, and following basically the advice of our public health authorities. Uh, we're, we need to flatten that curve altogether. And quite frankly, this is our biggest economic measure because the shorter time we will take to go through this pandemic, the better we can you know, go and, 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 and thrive again on, uh, with our economy. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, Following that, we, we really wanted to go and help people and have a people's first approach. And so while people, in order for people to follow the public health authority advice, they need to know that they, they'll be able to, to pay their rent and pay their mortgages or, or, or put food on the table. And so that's why we decided to expand massively the social safety net. At this point, the federal government didn't have time to create new programs. We decided to use what was available to us, knowing that our public service would be teleworking like all of us. And so we decided to use EI and expand massively its definition 
to include people that would be self-employed or people that didn't have enough hours on their ER or people that uh, you know, had to stay home because they were taking care of children because children are, are not in school right now or people that are sick that have COVID-19 or taking care of a person that is sick. And so all that became the now well-known CERB, uh, Canadian Emergency uh, Response Benefit. And uh, it is that famous $2,000 uh, per month that is uh, taxable and that is sent to, to, to people. Uh, I can take any questions regarding CERB and its eligibility. We decided also to increase the Canada Child Benefit by $300 per children and also making sure that people would have access to more GST credits. So people have been receiving checks recently. Yes, it is an increase that you're allowed to have and you were providing you, uh, which is the, the, the GST tax credit. Uh, and there are other measures also I can answer questions about that. Um, and finally, following a, our people first approach, we decided to come up with an economy package. Now, at the beginning, how uh, our Department of Finance and the government saw uh, this was really a, a, a movement in, in the demand. And in, the, in terms of the supply would be there, people would still have inventories and, and things to sell or services to be, to be sold and, and provided. Uh, but the demand would move maybe in time. So maybe for two, three months, there wouldn't be that much demand, but it would recover afterwards. And so we saw that as a liquidity issue. We saw that as a necessity for us to step in through our banking sector, push banks to lend more cash to businesses in order for them to mend that gap. Now, um, we worked with the banks. Uh, the Bank of Canada reduced its key indicator. We also uh, change some regulations to the banks to make sure to deploy $300 billion to our banking system. And the six CEOs of our chartered banks have said they would be making things more flexible, they would reduce interest rates and, 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 and you know, differ payments in time. Now, my question to you and your members is really, um, is that happening in Halifax? How is that happening in Nova Scotia? Is that, you know, there's one thing being said in Bay Street, is that happening in Truro? Is that happening in Halifax? Uh, is the bank manager really taking more risk? Because at the end of the day, the federal government took more risk on its shoulders. So the bank banks should be taking more risk. So that's a question that uh, I would like to be able to follow up with you. Sure. Uh, and, and definitely also with, with Andy and, and Daryl and, and uh, Rene, who are all on the line. Um, and so we, we went ahead with that. And bit by bit, as we were looking how the situation was evolving, our reading of the, the crisis changed. And we had to come up with a wage subsidy to go with subsidies rather than only liquidity. Because we didn't want to move in time more debt to our businesses. We, we wanted to help them uh, deal with, with the issue and, and reduce their burn rate and lower their fixed costs. So that's why we came up with the now well-known wage subsidy program, 75% of uh, your wages up to $58,700. And uh, you're allowed to have access to it if you can show 30% of losses. I can answer questions about how you calculate the 30% of losses. Um, so that, and we came up also with the $40,000 loan to small businesses. Uh, and if you pay back within two years uh, that interest for the loan, you can keep 10000 of it. So it becomes a $10,000 subsidy. And we made sure also to defer in time the payment of taxes and, and custom duties and other, um, other taxes usually and, and duties that you would have to pay the, to the federal government. Bear in mind that the, the idea is to make sure you keep more money in your pocket while dealing with the stress and, and, and you know, the crunch you're going through uh, uh, through your, your revenues. So this is, this, these are the measures that we've put in place of the federal government. I know the Nova Scotian government came up also with rent uh, payment uh, measures and, and different other fixed cost measures, so that's helpful. Um, 
but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is move fast. Uh, this crisis is going very fast. It is affecting your businesses. It is affecting people across this country. And uh, we want it to be flexible and nimble, knowing that we would be covering 80% of cases and you know we would get to the 20% of cases as we move on. So the idea of this call also is to identify the gaps, being able to address them, and, uh, and uh, also communicate uh, what, is, what, is, what we're working on and, uh, and really being able to provide you as much information as possible while basically information is so key right now to all of us. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. That's a great summary of, of kind of where we are. And, and I'm really pleased to hear you say that you're still interested in learning where the gaps are. Uh, yeah. Because there are clearly still gaps. And, and for some of the reasons that you've articulated, uh, I think, you know, as we roll things out, we had to deal with the most vulnerable first. But now we're getting to the point where, yeah. okay, how do, we, how do we actually deal with some of these additional? So yeah. I did get some questions submitted from a number of folks. Uh, yeah. who are good enough to do that. So I'm going to ask uh, um, Martha Casey from Volta to raise her hand because we're having a little trouble identifying you there, Martha. Uh, but if you could raise your hand uh, just by clicking at the lower right-hand side, um, I think we, yeah. can, uh, we can jump on and find you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yes, Martha, you're on with the, uh, the minister. Excellent. Thank you so much, Patrick. And uh, thanks for being here, Minister. It's, sure. it's and thanks for all that uh, that you and your colleagues are doing. I know it's been a busy time. So I uh, I'm um, I work at the uh, the sort of startup hub, one of the biggest in Atlantic Canada. Um, well, I guess the biggest east of Montreal. But really speaking, on behalf of the startup community across Atlantic Canada, many of the companies here are pre-revenue, so they are very early stage. I know there's some exciting work um, happening for sort of growth stage, but a big piece of sort of the startup industry here is that is that earlier stage. And they there's some concern that they're falling through the cracks right now. So they're not um, they're not qualifying for some of the things that the government's put out. And the most critical thing right now we're hearing is cash in hand. You know, if, if there's some flexibility to cash in hand. So I wonder if there's any work that's being contemplated with ACOA or other RDAs across, you know, across Canada um, to address the needs of these very early stage companies? So that's a good question. Um, so different things. The um, startups can have access to the wage subsidy uh, on a case by case basis if they're uh, business that have started since February of 2019. So I think at this point, it is worth it to have a conversation with the Canada Revenue Agency. Okay. If that conversation is not successful, let us know. Uh, you know, either through Andy or Daryl, uh, definitely uh, by, by talking to their staff in their, in their uh, members' uh, office uh, or through Patrick and the Chamber. Um, okay. So that second thing, a call has not received yet an increase of uh, budget. Uh, let's cross our fingers. Uh, the idea was to make sure we would go as fast as possible using EI and our fiscal, you know, fiscal capacity and, and banks. Uh, but we're getting to more specific issues right now. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic while being realistic. And uh, I know that ACOA has uh, really supported many incubators in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's certainly the idea of keeping supporting uh, these great incubators to help startups all across Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada. So uh, thank you for raising this. This is some, something that we're working on. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I did get a comment back from the Restaurant Association on your question on banks. Uh, so the banks and lending institutions are asking for more and more personal guarantees, uh, even for long-time customers. Um, does the federal government have any influence in pressuring banks uh, or uh, credit unions, I suppose, we don't want to forget about those, to ensure that they're opening up um, and being a little more flexible on some of those loan terms? Mm -hmm. So uh, Bill Morneau, uh, the Minister of Finance, is having conversations with banks pretty much every day trying to push them uh, to uh, be more flexible, but also make sure that the, 
they don't go up and, and ask so much, you know, guarantees. Uh, and that's always a, a, an issue. Uh, that's why we came up with the uh, $40,000 uh, loan, which is guaranteed by the government of Canada. So you don't need to show it any personal guarantee. And, uh, and it's a zero interest loan and it becomes eventually a subsidy. Uh, part of it becomes a subsidy if you're able to repay. Now, I know the question is being asked by Restaurants uh, Canada. Uh, we know we have an issue with restaurants and hospitality. I'm also the minister in charge of tourism, and uh, I'm very much aware that the tourism sector, which includes restaurants and hotels, are deeply affected by what's going on, and the recovery will be difficult. And so, therefore, we're, we're, we're aware of that, and we're looking at options. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Dar uh, Darlene Grandfinder, if you could raise your hand, if we could unmute you, um, if we can. It's a little hard to find people actually doing this. Um, I'm just going to ask Darlene's question for you, uh, for her. Uh, so, <laughs> Thank so, you, Darlene. Okay. Um, th there was a meeting, and you talked a little bit about tourism a moment ago. There was a, apparently a meeting with the uh, Federal Standing Committee on Finance last Friday to hear more about the impact the crisis is having on tourism. Uh, and the there was a recovery program uh, proposed by, I suppose, Kayak, uh, given the unknown time frame around potential travel restrictions. Um, is there any discussion about a support package specifically targeted for seasonal tourism operators who've not yet opened? Okay, so different things. Um, at the beginning of this crisis, the Minister of Finance clearly said that there were two particular sectors of the economy that were mostly impacted. It was the oil and gas sector, uh, because of what was going on in the, on the financial markets, and it was the tourism sector, including airline carriers. So we are aware of that. Uh, but as I said, wanted to go as broad as possible at the beginning to go to more specific cases afterwards. So that's where we're at right now. We're still having conversations and I'm in close contact with the Tourism Assist in Industry Association of Canada, TIAC. Uh, Charlotte Bell and I talk to each other, my team also. So uh, we're aware of their uh, you know, suggestions. Um, as for seasonal workers, what the Minister of Employment said over the weekend was for the CRB, so for the $2,000 uh, amount per, per, per month, uh, there are still regulations to be changed, but there, we are looking to see how seasonal workers could have access to it. Uh, because we're very much aware that in Atlantic Canada and Nova Scotia uh, and throughout the country, there are lots of seasonal workers and they can't fall through the cracks. So that would be like the social safety net solution. Uh, I know I'm not answering your question regarding, uh, you know, the wage subsidy we have to do more work on that for seasonal business to have access to it. And, uh, and also, uh, but obviously they can have access also to the $40,000 uh, loan uh, if they have between 50,000 and a million dollar worth of wages. Now, if they don't, uh, that's another conversation and we're looking at options right now. Uh, definitely, uh, I think it's worth that you flag your issue to a co-op. I know Chuck is on the line. I know many of uh, the ECOA people are on the line uh, because we want to know your reality. Uh, I've also repurposed some funding to support a bit more tourism, but as I said at the beginning, there's no increase of budget yet in ECOA. And so therefore our capacity is, is still limited at this point, but things may change. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Rustam Southwell from the, uh, the Black Business Initiative. Rustam, I've unmuted you, I think. I think. So can you hear me then? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Russell, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Minister Jolly, good seeing you again. Hello, my friends at LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Oh, oh. <laughs> you hear your radio there. <laughs> the, the cell phone for some reason. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, just for. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. No, shut off. Considering, considering the, the many services that um, the companies in the, in the African Nova Scotia and the Black community has done in work with, um, with ACOA over the many, many years. 
it's likely that as a consequence of uh, COVID-19 uh, neg negative economic impact, it could wipe out 20, 20 years, two decades of uh, business development gains in the black community. So when I'm considering this, I just have to ask what needed supports and initiatives are being considered to support the unique uh, business continuity plans of this vulnerable business sector. And mm -hmm. would such a lens be used when developing stimulus initiatives that go forward? Um, that's a good question, Rustam. I, I know the Minister of uh, Diversity and Inclusion is really working on different scenarios, British Tiger. Uh, and so definitely it's worth it that your team and yourself be in contact with, uh, with her and her team uh, because they're strong advocates and we could definitely work with them. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, I, see, I see Andy uh, Fillmore has asked a question. Um, I think we should, we should let Andy ask a question. Andy, go ahead. <laughs> Is it a pun or what? <laughs> nice to see you, Melanie, and thank you for joining us. And Pat, thanks for making the opportunity. Yeah, I just want to pass on two common questions that I'm getting from the community here in Halifax. The first is around the Canada Emergency uh, Bank account and the, the minimum $50,000 payroll that's required to access that. Um, are there any flexibilities coming that would allow new companies and therefore have, who have a smaller payroll or startups that, therefore, that have a small payroll to come in to still have access to it even though they don't quite meet the $50,000 salary? That's, that's the first question. Okay. The second one is around the wage subsidy. And this question is, um, I've got to remind myself, it was for. Um, they won't be able to show their revenue loss till later, I guess. That's right. So, it, we, of course, we have many tourism industries that uh, aren't going to be able to show their revenue loss until later, as well as engineers and contract based companies that are flush right now with 30, 60, and 90 day invoices coming in. But the, because there's no work, those are going to stop and their losses will be booked uh, in the coming months. So, future losses rather than past losses. Thank yeah. you. Okay, good. So for the first question, uh, we're very much seized with the fact that there's, there's an issue with smaller businesses that don't have 50,000 wages. Tourism operators, uh, you know, some, some aestheticians and, 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 uh, and hairdressers, and like, we hear that. Uh, we're looking at options right now. Uh, definitely, they can de uh, look at the Community Futures Program which is administered, uh, you know, across Nova Scotia and is supported through ACOA. They haven't received uh, an increase yet, uh, but this could definitely some be something we would be looking at, and that could be very helpful. Uh, technically, they're they're providing smaller types of loans, uh, you know, between five to fifteen thousand, but for these businesses, it's that that's pretty much the amount they they need. Uh, so that's one thing. Second thing, uh, regarding uh, your question, future losses. Um, well, we've allowed two types of accounting to uh, show that uh, you've incurred 30% of losses. It's either uh, cash accounting so, or, or accrual accounting. Accrual accounting can help sometimes, depending particularly in the tourism sector, for example, if you haven't received uh, cash yet, but you've had some many, you know, bookings, um, but it doesn't solve everything. So if you could any tests with your different uh, entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, these two accounting methods, whether it's helping them or not, or still is, is if there's still a gap, well, therefore uh, that would be helpful. And let me know because obviously we're still having conversations with finance at this point. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks. you. Um, okay, um, I, I want to remind everybody I'm focusing on uh, questions that are related to the federal initiatives. So I see a lot of questions about provincial initiatives. I'm happy to stay on the line and answer everything I know about the provincial initiatives because I may know a little bit more um, than the uh, than the minister uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the call. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, Ross Jefferson, I think you're uh, available and wanted to get you to ask a question from Discover Halifax. 
Thank you. It's uh, great to see you again, uh, Mr. Jolie. Thanks for joining us on the call. And uh, I'd like to echo um, my previous colleagues' uh, recognition of the exceptional response of the federal government. So thank you to your colleagues, Sandy, uh, Renee, uh, Daryl, and uh, obviously the, uh, the bureaucrats that have uh, helped uh, put this together. Uh, my, my first question's already been uh, answered, so I think I'll skip on to a, a second question. Um, we know that many communities uh, across Canada, their tourism industries are heavily reliant on programs to support the development of tourism uh, originating from uh, hotel levies. Um, I, I think the last estimate is it's around $500 million uh, across the country uh, that's collected through hotel levies that support um, uh, communities' efforts for marketing and, and quite frankly, also, I think, for uh, recovery initiatives that we're looking at right now. I'm curious if the federal government uh, is considering uh, support uh, for that and for those communities that, that are being impacted from the, uh, from the loss of hotel levies. Like I was saying, definitely the tourism sector is something that we are looking at um, uh, in terms of support because we know that uh, this sector that was, you know, pretty much a cannery in a coal mine because it was first impacted with the Chinese tourists not coming to the West, not coming as much to Vancouver and Alberta and Banff and, and we saw that. Uh, and so we decided to act very quickly and then eventually it just, the, the occupancy rate of many hotels, uh, well, of hotels across the country is at 10% right now. And very much a, a aware that there are issues in terms of dealing with the hotels and, and even getting access to, 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 uh, to you know, loans and, and financing. Um, so uh, I know, so definitely we're having conversations at the federal level. In terms of, um, you know, different uh, organizations that are based on, are supported through uh, provincial uh, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that are, are supporting their activities. Uh, some provinces have, have decided to step up. I was looking at the Quebec recently announced that they would be uh, basically refunding many of these organizations. So I hope that uh, you can definitely have a good conversation with Nova Scotia about that. Uh, meanwhile, definitely through ACOA, uh, we can support tourism operators themselves and uh, we can support many tourism businesses. But like I said, we haven't increased yet the budget of ACOA. We hope that is happening in the coming weeks, we'll see, days and weeks. Uh, and therefore, we would be able to provide more support to the different tourism operators. So that's the best answer I can give you at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mary Dempster uh, from Atlantic Coach, uh, Coach Atlantic Transportation. Mary, uh, I think you can speak now. Did you have a question? Well, I'll ask Mary's question. Um, seasonal workers, so uh, the CERB, um, for seasonal workers who've not yet started working. Oh, Mary, are you there now? Yes, sorry. Go ahead. You're thank on. Thank you. Sorry, Minister Jolie. Thank you. Um, many of us Hi. have seasonal workers. Um, uh, we provide uh, busing for cruise ships, multi-days, and so on in Atlantic Canada. And, um, you know, we have uh, double-decker drivers and people who haven't started. You did mention that the CERB uh, that you are considering seasonal workers would have yeah. access. So this uh, indeed would be uh, huge for a company of our size where we uh, have people who come back year over year over year and, and consider themselves full-time seasonal employees, <laughs> although they are just seasonal. So um, obviously there are 30 weeks of benefits have, uh, have dried up. Um, so that would be wonderful. And the other thing on the CERB was that it doesn't allow for making any extra money um, or coming in to help us for the very few movements that might be occurring for bus service. Because of course, if they earn funds during uh, receiving CERB, there is no clawback like EI. So um, has there been consideration by the government? I know we've talked to Andy uh, about this as well, and it's and not just our company, but many companies, if they can keep their employees close 
do a couple of hours, half a day, maybe a day, you know, whatever the, the government feels is appropriate and not let them um, stay idle and not be able to help us out when we need them most. Well, you can underserve, you can do up to 10 hours per week. Uh, that's the maximum allowed. So there's some flexibility. It's not a lot. It's 40 hours during a month. Uh, but it is, you know, uh, maybe it, it, it can provide you a bit of flexibility you were looking for, Mary. So uh, that's, for, uh, that's for your question. And regarding, like you were saying, seasonal workers, the Minister of Employment, uh, Carla Coltro, is, is looking at solutions. Uh, we have a uh, COVID-19 cabinet committee later on today. So uh, we're, we're actively working extremely hard to make sure that we can be responding as quickly as possible. So just to clarify, um, you just Sorry. said that you can work up to 10 hours. Uh, so I, is that new information? I think it's new. Is that uh, it was announced last week by the Prime Minister. Oh yes, okay. I don't think he was clear about, and we haven't seen it in print yet. Uh, no announced okay. by the prime minister last week okay. uh, we have to deal with a specific issue at the beginning because a lot of the voluntary fire workers uh didn't want to lose the access to serve if they had to sometimes go and help a small community so that started with this case and then eventually uh many of uh people were were losing their contracts or losing right. uh their jobs, but you know, not to a point they had no revenues. So we didn't want to push people into uh, really dire circumstances. So that's why we decided to show a bit of flexibility. Oh, no, that's great. I think that's, that's really good. Thank you very much for that. Jordy Morgan from CFIB. Jordy, uh, I think you can talk. Hi, Minister. Thank you very much. I know that you uh, meet with our colleagues regularly in Ottawa, but I was just informed that in the Prime Minister's briefing today, he mentioned that there would be commercial rent supports, not to uh, throw things at you from the sidelines, but I know that this has been <laughs> a, a discussion that's been, that's been happening, uh, the idea of wage abatement. It's a big thing in Nova Scotia for our members here as well, in spite of the fact that we do have a rent deferral program. Can you provide any... Uh, not national secret uh, direction on where that commercial <laughs> rent support might be going uh, for us on this call? Well, what I can tell you is I haven't, re I haven't uh, listened yet to the, minister, the Prime Minister's speech. I will be doing this uh, after this. Um, but definitely uh, what we're looking at is how to reduce the burn rate of businesses because we are very much aware that when we came up with the wage subsidy, it was, it was definitely to keep a link between employers and employees, but it was helping mainly more the service sector than maybe the manufacturing sector. Because when you look at a service sector, I used to own a, a, and, and, and be in charge of a business that was a communication uh, company. My biggest uh, fixed costs were my employees, but it is not the case, for example, in the manufacturing sector where it can be equipment and you know your huge warehouse and so we were very much aware of that and so we wanted to also provinces to step up to make sure that they could play their role uh, not all provinces have stepped up so we i think we'll be looking at the case-by-case -case basis um, as to how that would be done i'm not sure yet uh, would it be through a coa i'm not sure yet so I'll provide you more information for you when I have some. And of course, we'll go through Patrick. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I'm just looking- So this is how we, we govern right now. So we, we go very fast. <laughs> yes, real-time policy making. That's it. <laughs> we're we're yeah. building the, the plane as we fly it, but we right. have no- Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the, uh, the uh, Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, I see a question here. Can laid off employees currently receiving CERB who are receiving top-ups from a registered, oh boy, this is a big question, um, uh, supplementary unemployment benefit plan qualify for the 75% uh, Canadian Employment uh, Emergency Wage Subsidy? In other words, can they get the wage subsidy on top of the top-up? Sounds like too many top-ups to me. 
but well i've received that question in the past about pop-ups uh if, if, if you know there's still like there's still a gap but on this specific question i don't want to give you bad advice so my team will follow up on that okay great um i see another question here uh from uh, chris copper smith they're a manufacturer that's retooling to help meet the short-term demand for locally produced ppe and medical equipment What's the government's plan uh, for medium to long term procurement of PPE? Mm -hmm. Will they keep going after the emergency? So for folks who are retooling, should they keep retooling or should they think about stopping, you know, as soon as the emergency is over? I think no decision has been taken, but what we know is that we'll have to have an approach uh, when it comes to PPE that uh, um, that uh, make sure that we have more personal pr protective equipment in, in future contexts and that we have a bit more of a uh, PP, you know, sovereignty approach where we can be able to have our own supply chain across the country. Right. Um, that's certainly conversations that we're having internally. And, uh, and I think that uh, the businesses that have decided to step up and retool and take the risks, well, thank you, because that's extremely uh, helpful. And uh, I think in the past, many governments have, uh, you know, have not necessarily taken this issue as seriously as they could have. Uh, I think none of us thought we would be going through a pandemic during our lifetime. And so definitely this key learnings from this crisis uh, will definitely be how to make sure that we have always good PPE at our disposal in the future. Okay. Uh, Rick Allwright from the Yarmouth Chamber of Commerce has asked, um, has your government considered removing the payroll requirements for this, the uh, community emergency business account? So uh, removing the $50,000 at the bottom end and the $1 million at the top end because we're getting a lot of comments from folks who are either under or just over the $1 million and don't qualify. Okay, so at this point, the information I have and that we have and that the government has indicated is that it's between 50,000 and a million. So it hasn't changed. Uh, we know we have an issue with smaller businesses. I answered that question a bit earlier. I think it was Andy's question uh, and the Community Futures Program for higher than 1 million. I think at this point is having a conversation with BDC and your bank. That is key. Uh, also, if you had funding with ACOA in the past and you still uh, are, uh, need to uh, repay it, well, we've made some payment deferrals uh, of our interest-free loans. Uh, and I think it's worth it to be in contact with Chuck and his team at ACOA. Okay, great, okay. Um, Kareem George, uh, I see you have a question, so I'm, I'm put, making you live. Can you ask your question, Kareem? Nobody's ready for me. Uh, so I'll ask Kareem's question. Hi, Minister, uh, how are you? I'm good, good. How are you? I'm very good, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. I do have a very simple question for you. Um, can we apply for the wage subsidy, the 10%, uh, the temporary one, until we have more information regarding the 75%? Okay, that's a good question. So the 10% wage subsidy doesn't exist anymore. It is only 75%, okay? okay? So if there's no two programs, there's one program, it's 75%. And uh, the program should be launched within a week and a half or two max. Okay. So meanwhile, I think what you can do is go on the CRA account and uh, go under uh, my business account and register. And uh, that would be helpful. Uh, good to go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that you can uh, have access to the money as quick as possible. Uh, we can be we can be happy uh, about how the CRA has dealt with uh, the CERB uh, um, program because it has uh, given, sent checks and made bank transferred very quickly. So sure. well, that, that will be sure. the case. Perfect. Uh, one follow-up question. Uh, yeah. I, I have reduced uh, some of my, my employees 50%. Uh, um, can they apply for the CERB? If they didn't lose their job, they can't. 
Thank you. So it's they have to have lost their job uh, and another job for 14 days. Uh, okay. That's, that's Perfect. okay. Perfect. Although Thank I don't so think you need a record of employment, uh, Karim, so they can be temporarily laid off. Right, so you can lay them off. They don't need a record of employment to apply for for serve at this point. And maybe the minister is going to correct me, but I'll I'll just go with that for now. Um, <laughs> for companies that uh, opened in February, so from Rene Arsenault, for new companies, very new companies that opened in February, how can they show their average income for the months of January, February to prove a 15 or 30 percent decline to qualify so, for the wage subsidy? So the CRA will go on a case by case basis in that context for new new new, new companies. And so it's worth it to have a conversation with the CRA. Okay. Um, and then uh, as kind of a follow-up, freelancers. So I spoke to a company the other day that spent $125,000 in freelance contracts, but those are not payroll. Um, so they're considering actually hiring those people as full-time employees uh, so that they could qualify for the wage subsidy. Do you think that would be okay? Um, you know, at this point, I'm not an accountant. I'm a lawyer, though, but uh, uh, I think, you know, I don't want to give legal advice. <laughs> I think, it, I, you know, I think it's, it's worth it to have a conversation with your accountant uh, to make sure that you, you take good business decisions. Okay. A couple of last qu quick questions. I, I see our time is growing short. Your vision for tourism this summer. Do you mm -hmm. have a vision for tourism? Uh, I'm sure we all do. What, what's yours? Well, I think if you would have asked me the question a month ago, my vision would have been a bit different. Uh, at this point, it really depends on the advice of public health officials and how we'll be do, dealing with uh, the spread of the virus and, and also how we'll be enforcing social distancing rules. Uh, but definitely what I think is people will want to travel the country. They will want to see their own country. Uh, and, you know, thinking about the recovery of the tourism sector, I think we can think of Canada first. And uh, I think there were issues before the pandemic uh, linked to the fact that cost of access to different destinations was high and that uh, tourism was a bit too much focused in our three big cities. And we had to bring people, particularly international visitors, to our different beautiful regions. And uh, I, you know, never, never, how can I say, uh, you, you have to use a good crisis to be able to change things. And I would love in the context of our new tourism approach to be able to deal with systemic problems that were there before the crisis. Okay. So that's my vision. Okay, that's a great vision. Um, uh, MP Baptiste uh, asked a question. He's wondering if the 10 hour exemption has a link yet. If you're aware of one, I'm not. Um, the PM mentioned it. Uh, I think it's uh, Carla Culture will have to do it through regulations. So it's not there yet. But what I can tell you, though, is you can go on the uh, CNRB, so Canadian Network, uh, uh, CB, <laughs> sorry, Canadian <laughs> Business Resilience Networks. Oh, yes, okay. CA cbrm.ca, you can maybe Patrick send it to your members. And that's real time, real time changes uh, that are posted on this website. Every single business owner should look at this website and definitely their accountants and their lawyers because that's where we've, the federal government has just made a, an agreement with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and that's how we'll be working going ahead uh, in terms of communicating the latest changes. Okay, great. Okay. And, and that's with the Canadian Chamber of Commerce and the Government of Canada. So a number of groups, actually. So we'll, we'll get that out to everyone. Um, what can businesses do to prepare for a recovery as we, uh, as we look to the future? Well, I think, you know, dealing with, uh, first and foremost, dealing with your liquidity issues, uh, but that's maybe me using my former hat of consultant. Uh, um, and definitely there will be a stimulus package eventually. We're still in the stabilization phase. Uh, we are still looking at how we can stop the bleeding and stabilize the patient. And, uh, and so once we're out of that, we will look at how can we uh, help our economy rebound 
And uh, at this point, my best advice to you is while dealing with liquidity is keep your employees and use the wage subsidy program because you rehiring everybody will be more difficult. Uh, and, uh, and I know a lot of people may see the SERP solution as a good one, um, but um, it will have an end. It will have, it, it's, it's four months, that's it, that's all. Uh, and then, you know, the idea is to make sure that people can, can be working. So I think that the wage subsidy program, when, you know, activated in, in a week and a half, two weeks, I think this will provide a lot of good solutions to people. And, and you've just alluded to it. I mean, the, the CERB program has a, is a finite amount of time. Um, you know, we are getting comments from businesses who, who originally laid off workers but now would like to recall them. So restaurants that are transitioning to take out. Yeah, and they can. Uh, well, they can, but the workers aren't as excited about coming back uh, because they're actually making more on CERB. So I know the province of Quebec has actually introduced an, an additional amount. Um, should that be something provinces should be thinking about? <laughs> uh, yes, Patrick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Obviously, no, I'm not in Nova Scotia right now. You can hear it from my accent. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, I think also that, um, uh, you know, restaurants are doing it right now. They can rehire. If they laid off since March 15, they can rehire. And the government will be paying 100% of their... CPP and EI payments. So it doesn't cost you anything to rehire them. Uh, and, and so it, that's also helpful because obviously when you lay off people, you have to pay CPP and EI. So rehire them, will reimburse you, and also you can have access to the weight subsidy. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Minister. Okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to end it there, Minister. I know you have another, uh, another call. Uh, so very much appreciate you uh, joining us today. Is there anything you'd like to say to the people in, across Nova Scotia at, uh, at this point? Oui, merci. Uh, so uh, two things. I think, uh, thank you, Patrick, for your work, uh, because uh, chambers of commerce across this country and Europe have never been more important have never been more important. Why? Because um, we need to be able to uh, work with you to transfer the information. We're bombarded with information right now and the information needs to be reliable as people are managing, managing risks and taking business decisions every day. Uh, and also more you, you are organized and get your members' interests known to the government, better we can react. And that's how we're, we're working right now. So that's my first point. Second point is to all of you. Uh, I know these are very anxious times and this is a very tough economic crisis. Um, I've, I've been in business in, in the past. My, my spouse is, in, is a small business owner. I see him working like a dog trying to find ways to uh, stay alive. And so it really hits close to home. And so my point to you is uh, business is yes, based on direct input, supply, demand, and and sales, but it's also based on confidence and trust. And so um, if, if we can be uh, working together to make sure we have that trust, that confidence that the future will be brighter, that this is a tough moment, but the pandemic will stop and we'll be able afterwards to recover. And meanwhile, we'll be there to help, to help you cross the bridge and get on the other side of the shore. So keep it up guys. Uh, and let's make sure that in the coming weeks we can do this Zoom again uh, to make sure to see how things are evolving and uh, how we, we can make sure that our different measures are landing well. That's great. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you very much for joining us. And I also want to, to thank your staff at ACOA uh, who are joining many of us on a call every couple of days. And Andy uh, Fillmore, particularly, I know all the MPs are working very hard, but Andy is also uh, joining us on a call uh, every two days. So really appreciate his, uh, his time and effort. So thank you very much for joining us today. We are doing webinars uh, every day uh, to try and keep everyone up to date. Uh, I would encourage you to go to our page at uh, halifaxchamber.com slash COVID-19 um, to the Business Resiliency Network. Um, I don't have the URL off the top of my head, but you'll, you can find it through Google. Um, and uh, there's also up-to-date information there. Uh, we have recorded this, uh, this webinar. 
so that will be available to all attendees shortly. So thank you very much, everyone. If folks did want to continue on the uh, on the webinar for another few minutes and ask questions about the uh, um, about the provincial programs, I do have some answers, um, and I'll uh, I'll let the minister go. So thank you again very much, minister. Thank you, Patrick. Take good care, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, uh, sorry, I should have said we did have 130 people on the call as well, uh, for those of you that were, uh, were interested, but we'll include that when we send out a note. Um, I did see a number of comments and questions about the, uh, the provincial programs. The one that I recall uh, particularly was, uh, was about retail. Um, the, uh, you may or may not be aware that the uh, provincial program, the business impact grant, is only available to businesses that were ordered to close or, or had business substantially curtailed, and that is actually businesses that were ordered to close. Uh, so that does not include um, other businesses uh, at this time, and it would even not include some businesses that you would typically think it would include, um, like uh, dentists and uh, some other folks. So uh, that is the case. My understanding is the provincial government is continuing to evolve that program. Uh, and uh, in conversation, our hope is that they will ultimately uh, see that there are other businesses that, uh, that are of need uh, and will, uh, will open up that program. Uh, but, uh, but to date, um, that's not available. Um, so, uh, you know, again, our hope is that that will, uh, that will continue. Um, I'm just flipping back to the uh, to some of the questions because I think those were some of the early questions. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just flipping through the question. Uh, that answers, I think, Jordy, that was your question on uh, uh, retailers. They were not ordered to close. Therefore, that uh, is not available yet from the province. Again, uh, Tim, same comment there. Um, the... Um, I would say there was someone who asked, asked uh, the role for Minister Jolie's department. Uh, we're certainly talking to all the various government departments. Um, it's probably fair to say that, uh, as the minister indicated, uh, ACOA has not yet received additional funding, but I think they're still in the transition phase of first we help the people, then we help the business, and then we're going to talk about recovery and transition. So I think that's uh, more to come. Um, Chris Cowper Smith, uh, the uh, Nova Scotia Bridge funding eligibility amount. Um, yeah, we know a little bit about that, uh, that information. There are two components from the provincial government. One is the bridge uh, funding, which is for individuals, which is for $1,000 one time. Uh, and then second, it's a $5,000 uh, amount called the business impact grant. Those are both available. Um, I don't know the URL, but you can certainly find them on our uh, halifaxchamber.com slash COVID-19 uh, page. Um, uh, you'll be able to find them on the uh, provincial page as well. They've changed, they continue to change that up. I think it's under support with a little heart. So you search Nova Scotia COVID-19 and you will get to the provincial page and there's a little heart uh, and it has information on business and individuals. Um, Let's see, uh, Bernadette Hamilton-Reed asked about specific support for sole proprietors. Um, I think many of the programs are available for sole proprietors. Um, uh, the, uh, I hope I don't get this wrong because I'm going kind of fast here, but the CERB does include uh, the opportunity for people who are only paid dividends, which is often the case for sole proprietors. Um, so if you go to the FAQs, you're able to find eligibility. There's a whole lot of information uh, there. Um, uh, thanks again, Andy, um, for the information. Amanda Mumbercat, uh, you talked about the um, chiropractors, physiotherapists, dentists are considered primary care uh, and encouraged to see uh, patients in emergencies only. Um, they can't have any income for 14 days. Well, I think we just clarified that a little bit. Uh, so you can have up to 10 hours a week. That's probably not enough, uh, but it's, uh, it's a good start. And I believe that 14-day period was only the first period. If you read the specifics, it's only the first month after that. It, it doesn't speak to the 14-day period at all, okay? Just to uh, clarify that. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, I see there's still questions coming in. I'm flipping down here um, uh, to... Uh, I would encourage uh, anybody who's on the call to additionally sign up for uh, the Halifax Chamber uh, newsletter. We're sending out information every couple of days. 
to uh, provide updates uh, as things change. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so Fairpoint, uh, Grisella mentioned that the uh, for many very small businesses, it is 15% uh, of revenue, that $5,000 grant. So that works out to about $600 a month. So yeah, it's a real, it is a worry. Um, I, I certainly hear that. Um, I think I've answered most of those questions. I'm just flipping over to the Q&A to see if there were any additional uh, comments there that are more uh, provincial. Um, no, I don't think so. So at this point, I, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. We will send out the information uh, on, uh, on both of these over the next, uh, next little while. So thank you very much. This will be recorded uh, and uh, we'll make it available to, uh, to everyone. Okay, thank you very much everybody and have a great day. Thanks.